to us by SharkCon, which returns July 15th through 16th to Tampa, Florida. National Geographic Shark Fest will be returning as their presenting sponsor. Find more personalities from Shark Week, Shark Fest, scientists, photographers, and celebrities from the shark world. We can also welcome the stars of Jaws 3 and Deep Blue Sea. Follow them on their website at www.sharkcon.com or on Facebook, www.facebook.com backslash sharkcon. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Shaking Up Science. So today we are going to be doing our first Shaking Up Science, where hopefully if you registered, you got your Megalo Margarita recipe. We are going to be joined by Dr. Stephen Godfrey. Uh, my name is Jen. I'm the Program and Outreach Manager here for Headwaters, and I just wanted to thank you so much for joining us today. If you are following along with us and are new, welcome. We are so excited to have you. We do have a whole bunch of different opportunities for you to you know, roll in with us and join and entertain with us. So we do have Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn, as well as the YouTube channel. So for today's special, we're going to go ahead and bring in Dr. Godfrey. So welcome. Uh, thank you very much, Jennifer. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you, SharkCon, for sponsoring this presentation. So uh, I have the wonderful uh, privilege of being the curator of paleontology at the Calvert Marine Museum here in Solomons, Maryland. And uh, this is year 25 for me. And uh, my mandate is to collect, preserve, and interpret uh, the fossils, mostly from along Calvert Cliffs. But in 2018, we became the, uh, the state center for Maryland for paleontology collections and research. So what I'd like to do this evening is uh, tell you uh, basically some stories about Megalodon. Uh, I realized that in my paleontological career, when I started out, I was focused just on what a fossil was and describing it and then publishing a paper on it. But I become much more interested in the stories that fossils tell. And I hope that uh, you get a sense of that this evening in, uh, in the fossils that I show to you and the stories that I tell you about the amazing things that, that we can learn from fossils and the information that we can extract uh, from uh, these amazing fossils that occur both here along Calvert Cliffs and elsewhere along the Atlantic uh, Coastal Plain. Uh, the photograph that you're seeing here is the one that was taken along Calvert Cliffs, and it's a beautiful section. These are Miocene uh, sediments that range in age from about 18 million years ago to about 8 million years ago. So there's roughly 10 million years worth of Earth's geologic history preserved in these sediments. And as they erode naturally, fossils come out of, come out of them. And, uh, uh, we collect uh, what we can. Uh, mostly we're interested in uh, dolphin and whale skulls, but of course there's a whole grist of uh, different kinds of sharks that have been found, fossil sharks, over 50 different kinds of fossil sharks that have been found in these sediments. So, uh, Megalodon. Everybody is fascinated by Megalodon, and uh, uh, seemingly we can't get enough of Megalodon, and so that's what I'm going to start with. Obviously it's an apex predator. It was one of the largest macro predators that ever existed. And I'm going to start out by showing you an example of what we think is scavenging uh, by Megalodon. We know that uh, this lineage of sharks, and basically we can start the story about 50 million years ago, they evolved to take advantage of the evolution and uh, uh, the diversification of marine mammals. And so Megalodon, the, the end member of that evolutionary lineage, which became extinct, we think about three and a half million years ago. Uh, was superbly well adapted at cutting apart prey that was too large to swallow whole. So uh, the first bone, as you can see on the lower portion of uh, this image, is part of the lower jaw of a baleen or filter feeding whale. Now whales during the Miocene weren't as large as the largest whales are today. And you can see from the graphic in the upper right hand corner, that's about the size that the whale would have been had humans been around uh, to, to, to be a scale model with them. You'll notice in the image at the bottom of the screen that there's a number of bite or gouge marks on the bone. Those were made by essentially an overachieving megalodon. And in the upper left-hand corner, you can see there's a line. Now, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but if you can, my cursor is pointing out basically a line where the edge of the shark tooth struck the bone 
And because there are those raking marks, we know that uh, it was um, a, the, the tooth that struck the bone was that of a megalodon, just because of the size of the bite marks that we find on this uh, whale jaw. There's no other shark large enough that lives uh, along Calvert Cliffs that could have made uh, these kind of markings. So the, the tiny serrations that comprise the cutting edge of megalodon tooth essentially raked the surface of the fresh bone, leaving it to become fossilized. Now, from the way the bone is preserved, we know that there was no, um, there's no evidence of healing. So if the whale was alive, and this represents um, an example of active predation, like megalodon attacked and killed the whale, obviously the whale did not survive because had the whale survived, there would be evidence of healing of callus formation. The outer layer of uh, tissue that covers the bone, the periosteum, is very sensitive to that. And so had the whale survived, it would have um, covered this over and uh, new bone growth would have occurred. So this is probably an example of, uh, of scavenging, but we don't know for sure. We can't tell if it's active predation or scavenging. So just to be on the safe side, we're going to go with, uh, this is an example of scavenging. Now we also think that uh, there are some examples of, uh, of uh, fossils that are preserved that show evidence of predation. So the next fossil that I'm gonna show you is one of the blackened bones that you can see down near the very end of the tail of the dolphin, just in front of the flute that propels the dolphin through the water. So this is a restoration of the skeleton of uh, one of the most common types of uh, Miocene dolphins that we find along Calvert Cliffs. So here's uh, one of these tail bones. And uh, the upper two images are looking at the vertebra in left uh, and right views. And then the lower one is kind of an oblique view down kind of parallel to the gouges that you see on both sides of the vertebra. Now in a normal dolphin vertebra, those gouge marks should not be there. The only way that you can get marks like that in a vertebra like this is that if at one point in this dolphin's existence, that vertebra was wedged between two adjacent megalodon teeth. But notice also that there's not just one gouge, so it didn't become wedged just once. It, be, it was wedged for, for the same number as there are gouges uh, along the both sides of the vertebra. So it's as though, well, the, each gouge represents a separate bite, right, by the megalodon. So it's as though megalodon is relaying the message to this dolphin, you are never going to get away from me alive. What's fascinating about uh, this vertebra is that when we look at modern great white sharks and the animals that they will scavenge, apparently they will not scavenge animals that are smaller than themselves. They will, as this photograph shows, they will scavenge animals that are larger than themselves. And here, great white is scavenging uh, the bloated carcass of a humpback whale. If the same is true for megalodon, in that they would not scavenge animals that are smaller than themselves. Oh, I should say that great whites will kill and eat animals that are smaller than themselves, but they won't scavenge smaller animals. If the same is true for megalodon, then they would not scavenge a tiny dolphin, but they would kill and eat a tiny dolphin. And so we think that this is good evidence of active predation by megalodon, where it was chasing down these dolphins, and just like modern great whites do, they will bite the caudal peduncle, right, the tail region, so as to cut uh, the tissue there, the muscles, and also the blood vessels, um, and the animal will bleed out. And so then, once the dolphin is dead, then they're just essentially scavenging a carcass. And so we think uh, that uh, uh, a rendering, a, a, an artist depiction of this is uh, probably what was happening to this dolphin in, an, in its encounter with Megalodon. Here's another really amazing fossil that came to us a number of years ago from, uh, you can see Norm Riker is the collector. He found it in Lee Creek, which uh, at the time was open to amateur collectors uh, to collect fossils from the spoil mines. This is a huge phosphate mine in North Carolina. And what you're looking at is a single tooth from a sperm whale, an extinct sperm whale. Unfortunately, we don't know what kind 
of sperm whale this tooth came from because we don't have the skull of this kind of sperm of, of this kind of sperm whale. You'll notice that uh, the crown of the tooth is very tiny. It's at the very top. And then the rest of uh, what you can see is the root of the tooth. Again, we know that this sperm whale had an encounter with either Megalodon or the immediate ancestor of Megalodon, a shark known as Ototus tubitensis. And that's because, as you can see here, that uh, twice in this view, uh, in the C image, uh, the tooth of one of these macro predators struck the tooth, one of which left these raking marks, again its calling card, that it bit forcefully into the jaws of the sperm whale. Notice also that these gouge marks occur well below the gum line. So this, the root of the tooth is deeply embedded in the jaw. And so this suggests a very aggressive, powerful bite by a megalodon on the face of this sperm whale. Now, it turns out that uh, the kinds of sperm whales that lived at this time didn't have kind of a lot of flesh on the head. They certainly were nowhere near as large as the modern um, sperm whale. So there wouldn't be much reason for a megalodon to specifically target and bite the head so forcefully if the sperm whale was already dead, if it was just scavenging the carcass. So we think that an illustration like this more accurately reflects what was happening at that time. That this kind of a fossil shows very aggressive behavior by Megalodon to basically mortally wound the sperm whale. Here's another very interesting uh, fossil. Obviously, it's a, uh, a very large and handsome tooth of Megalodon. And you'll notice uh, on the right-hand side, I've zoomed into the area on the tooth that's just above what's called the burlet. It's sort of that chevron shape. And you'll see that there are a number of raking or striation marks on the tooth. So this is a megalodon bitten megalodon tooth. And of course, the simplest way to explain this is that this tooth was still within the jaws of an individual megalodon and that the teeth in the opposing jaw, in this case, the lower teeth, I have the tooth upside down, but uh, the teeth from the lower jaw uh, came down and forcefully struck the tooth in such a way that the serrations on the edge of one of those teeth marked, uh, marked the burlet region of this megalodon tooth. However, there are other examples of uh, these megalodon bitten megalodon teeth which could not have been marked had it just been marked by a tooth in the opposing jaw. And here is one of these lovely examples where uh, the orientation of the striations are such that that tooth could not have been in an opposing jaw. It could have come about, I think, in two alternate ways. One, the megalodon bites into its prey, say a whale, and that tooth is shed into the body of the whale. And then the megalodon takes another bite, and as it comes in, that has shifted somewhat in the flesh, and so then the teeth in the jaw strike that tooth, marking it the way uh, that it was marked. Or it's also possible that it happened as a result of meg-on-meg -meg predation. We know from modern sharks that they will engage in, uh, in cannibalism. And so there's no reason to think that that did not also happen uh, within populations of megalodon. And so you could have that orientation of the striations of one megalodon tooth marking the tooth of its, of its prey or its adversary, uh, leaving those kind of marks that we see in that remarkable example of a, uh, a megalodon-bitten megalodon tooth. Here's just another example of, uh, of a megalodon-bitten megalodon tooth, and yet another one. You can see these fine striations over the surface. So there's uh, quite a remarkable diversity of these either self-bitten or predatory uh, encounters between different in individuals. We also think we have examples of failed predation. So amongst modern sharks, for example, great whites aren't always successful at killing their prey. And those animals typically bear in their bodies, right, the, 
the scars uh, from those failed predatory attempts by great white sharks. So the next uh, two bones that I'm going to show you, actually one's a bone and one's a, a megalodon tooth, were found uh, here in this section uh, along Calvert Cliffs. And this just gives you a sense of what the cliffs typically look like. Uh, they're made of, uh, of ma uh, marine sediments and they're not uh, indurated or consolidated. You can walk up to the cliff and, and actually start excavating with your fingernails. And you'll notice that further um, down the beach that uh, the cliffs can actually fail catastrophically. So we're always mindful when we're out along the cliffs to be very careful. Uh, it, you know, <laughs> we don't want the cliffs to collapse and hurt anybody. So the next uh, bone that I'm going to show you is a vertebra from the lumbar or lower back part of, again, a relatively small whale or a large odontocete or a large toothed whale, like a small sperm whale or a large dolphin. There's nothing diagnostic about that vertebra that I know of that would indicate uh, whether it comes specifically from a toothed whale or a baleen whale. But for the purpose of our discussion, uh, I'm going to refer to this uh, bone as having come from a whale. So here's the fossil in question. And uh, you'll notice that uh, the top, again, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but the top of the image shows the neural spine, kind of what you can feel when you run your fingers down your back. And then there's a hole just below that. That's where the spinal cord would go down the length of the backbone of the whale. And then on the sides are these prongs that stick out. Those are the transverse processes to which muscles attach. That, of course, allow the, the whale to, to move through the water. Notice first off that uh, on the one side of the, the rounded kind of centrum, there's a, in the upper half, much of that bone is missing. So what happened is this, this whale experienced a major trauma and uh, the blood supply to this upper section where the bone is missing, the blood supply was cut off and so the bone died. It became necrotic. Remarkably, the whale survived whatever the nature of this trauma was. And so the dead bone is being resorbed by osteoclasts, which are breaking down that dead bone. But this whale did not live long enough for it to fill in that bone. Perhaps it was filled with fibrous connective tissue at the time the whale died. Notice, however, that the bottom half of the vertebra is, is literally broken away from the remainder of the body of the centrum that damage is not due to um, like post-mortem after the whale died. So for example, the vertebra falling out of the cliffs and tumbling around in the surf on the beach. That damage happened while the whale was alive and it survived. And we know that because we've actually x-rayed these and CT scanned them. And so here are some uh, CT scan images. So the image on the left shows you kind of a transverse, I'm sorry, a, a sagittal view of the vertebra. You can see the neural spine at the top, the neural canal where the spinal cord would go, and then the centrum at the bottom. And you'll notice that there's this wide open fracture. Now the broken bone below that should actually fill in that space that says wide open, uh, open fracture here. Notice that the back end of the broken bone was actually telescoped. Uh, posteriorly, backwards, into the, the bottom of the vertebra. Below that, you'll see uh, the text that says new bone growth following the injury. So that new bone growth basically welded that smashed and broken and telescoped piece of bone into the bottom of the vertebra. Furthermore, the images A and B on the right-hand side of the image You'll notice that there's sort of a dark, I'm sorry, there's a very light color, a very white region. That shows the original outline of the vertebra. And then beyond that, you can see uh, in the text, it says periosteal reactive bone. That bone grew following the injury, following the trauma. And it could have come about as a result of infection or the force of the injury was so great that the tissue, the soft tissue that attached to the sides of that vertebra were actually physically ripped off the vertebra into that space. Then blood would have filled that space and turned into basically a giant blood clot, a hematoma, 
following that, uh, new bone growth would have grown into that area. So <laughs> what could have caused this kind of trauma that would have resulted in this major compression or spall fracture to this vertebra? So we know by looking at humans, for example, that um, people with osteoporosis, or if you're in an automobile accident and you don't have your chest strap across your chest, chest, but you just have the lap belt across, if you're in head-on collision, your body is jerked so violently forward that so much pressure is applied to your vertebrae that adjacent vertebrae can compress the bottom of the vertebrae and break it off. And so that's essentially what happened. Modern whales, uh, we, don't, we don't know this about fossil whales because it's not preserved in the fossil record, but modern whales can ingest uh, toxic algae as a result of uh, a toxic algal bloom. And uh, they're poisoned with the domoic acid. And that can result in spasms or seizures uh, that can occur in these whales prior to their death. What's interesting though is that amongst modern whales, we have no evidence that their seizures are great enough to actually break their bones. So this is, we can't rule this out as a possible explanation for why that vertebra was so badly uh, damaged. However, what's also interesting is that uh, there were two uh, vertebrae found, two pathological vertebrae, and with immediately next to those two vertebrae. I, again, I have, to, I have to emphasize that this, this megalodon tooth was not embedded in either one of these vertebrae, but it was found like right, right, right with it. Uh, this relatively small megalodon tooth was found. And you'll notice that the tip of the tooth is missing. Uh, there is what we would refer to as a spall fracture. So spall fractures can occur in shark teeth, and we see them fairly frequently in megalodon teeth. Uh, and, and we account for these by um, uh, a possible scenario where the force of the bite is so great and the tip of the tooth strikes something that's hard, like a, whale, like a bone in the, in the body of the whale, that the impact is so forceful that it overcomes the uh, integrity of the tip of the tooth and it just breaks it off. This tooth, again, we don't know that it is from the megalodon that, say, impacted, uh, plowed into, ambushed uh, the whale. Uh, it may have come about just as a result of serendipity. It was shed by a megalodon and it just happened to become preserved next to those two uh, vertebrae. Or it was, in fact, from the megalodon that caused the initial trauma, or it was from the megalodon that uh, eventually killed the injured uh, whale. Or finally, it was from just the megalodon that scavenged the already dead carcass uh, of the whale. So we don't know for sure. But to me, it's very suggestive that it was found so close to those two vertebrae. And so it's not unreasonable to suggest that that compression fracture with that all that in, either infection or periosteal reactive bone came about as a result uh, of this unbelievable impact, right ambush, either from below or from behind, plowing into the body of the whale with such force that it hyperflexed uh, the vertebra, spalling, uh, the verte uh, spalling that vertebra as it did. Now we're gonna leave megalodon, and I'm just gonna share with you a few other examples of uh, predation and scavenging and other really interesting stories that I've been able to tell from the fossils uh, that are preserved both locally and elsewhere along the Atlantic coastal plain. This is the humerus, the upper uh, flipper bone uh, of, a, of a whale, of a juvenile. It's uh, not a mature individual. And you'll notice that there are some uh, nearly vertical gouge marks. Well, those came about as a result of a shark biting forcefully on that bone and thrashing its head from side to side, its teeth gouging into the fresh bone. You'll also notice that there's the tip of a shark tooth embedded in the bone. And again, here, there's no evidence of healing. And so, again, this could be evidence of active predation or scavenging, not by a megalodon, but a, by a much smaller shark. Here is a lovely example of uh, a whale, a Miocene whale that was collected uh, just the, 
just this uh, radius actually. So this is one of the kind of the forearm uh, flipper bones in, in this uh, baleen whale. And you'll notice on both sides, there are these uh, a series of gouge marks. So they're shark bite marks, one, two, and three. So again, uh, this is actually really good evidence for scavenging because when a whale dies, its abdominal cavity becomes filled with gases. And so generally it flips over and its flippers then are sticking right out to the sides at the water's surface and sharks will come along and they generally start with the flippers and they will uh, bite down on the flipper and they'll sort of thrash their head back and forth. And again, here you can see where the teeth are cutting down into the fresh bone of the radius of this whale. And it's doing that so that it can cut off a piece. And then after it finished cutting off a piece at number one, it regrasped right at number two, shook its head, got, took some flesh off. And then again, had the bone further in its mouth and was shaking violently at three in order to, to peel off more of the uh, tissue that was surrounding the flipper of this whale. And so here's an artist rendering of what uh, uh, that could have looked like either the, the shark bitten humerus or the or the radius. If I were to have uh, our artist redo this, I would have had the whale upside down, floating at the water surface, kind of greatly bloated with the flipper sticking out to either side because uh, this the last one that I showed you, the, 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 uh, the radius, is really good evidence uh, of scavenging. And we see that uh, in modern, uh, the way that uh, sharks will prey, or not prey, but scavenge uh, uh, modern whales. We even have a fossil dolphin skull that has uh, shark bite marks and a shark tooth embedded right in its eye socket. <laughs> uh, I mean, again, really gruesome stuff, but I'm sorry, that's just the, the way, uh, you know, life and death happened during the Miocene as it happens today. So shark on shark predation is, uh, is going on today, both cannibalism and uh, one kind of shark uh, feeding on another, preying on another kind of shark. But it's exceedingly rare in the fossil record. And so here's a really nifty example that we recently published on. So up in the left-hand corner, you can see a circular vertebra that would be looking at the front or the back of a shark backbone piece, a single vertebra. And then immediately below it is uh, this sort of rectangular view of the vertebra inside view. And then the three images in the center and right are enlarged images of a partial uh, shark centrum, shark vertebrates. It wasn't fully preserved. This is all that we have of this individual. And you'll notice the blue arrow is pointing at two shark teeth that are embedded in the body of uh, this vertebra. And what's nifty is uh, that we took this to Johns Hopkins, their uh, School of Engineering Material Science Department, and we worked with uh, Philip Chapman, and uh, they have this uh, lovely high-end micro CT scanner. And so you can see in this little, towards the center of the image, there's a little foam block, and that vertebra is embedded in the foam. And the foam is essentially transparent to the high energy x-rays that come out of the disc over here. And then you can see this uh, square uh, box that, that picks up the, the x-rays that penetrate, go through, uh, the, the fossil. And then the, the whole fossil rotates 360 degrees and uh, there's roughly like a thousand images that are made and then they put all of those images into software which then can give you essentially a complete view of the vertebra and the two little shark teeth that are embedded in it. So here is again the image of the fossil image at the top and then these ghosty images at the bottom showing the two shark teeth embedded in this vertebra. What's interesting, I'm just gonna back up here to this slide. There is a little bit of swelling around these shark teeth that would indicate that the shark that was bitten actually survived the encounter. There would, there would be no evidence of healing of additional uh, tissue growing around those shark teeth if this shark had not survived the encounter. So it would, could be evidence of failed predation it could be evidence of uh, an accidental strike or bite in say a feeding frenzy. One shark you know, was feeding and was so excited as they uh, often are and bit another shark accidentally. 
or it could have come about perhaps as a result of a love tussle. I don't know. I love showing this photograph, especially when I'm giving this talk in person, because I generally ask the audience if they know what this is. And uh, <laughs> this is one of the most amazing fossils uh, that was found by uh, uh, an amateur slash professional uh, paleontologist here along Calvert Cliffs. And you'll notice that there's an object, and then there are some sharp tooth impressions into that material. And uh, not to keep you guessing any anymore, the material in which the shark tooth impressions are preserved is actually fossilized feces. And we would refer to that as a coprolite. And the coprolite was probably produced by uh, a marine crocodile. So this is a uh, shark bitten coprolite. And in the lower left, you can see uh, in the photograph, the gentleman who found this, Dougie Douglas. And uh, that he found it along this section of uh, Calricus, a place uh, called Western Shores. Now, because these are shark tooth impressions, it's a negative. What I did was around the perimeter of those impressions, I put a little uh, wall of plasticine. And then I took a silicon rubber casting compound. I mixed it up. I poured it in, left it for 24 hours, and then I pulled it out. And so along the bottom of this slide, you can see the shape of the shark teeth that impressed the feces. And from those, we can tell that uh, the shark that bit this was actually a Miocene tiger shark. What's fascinating is that uh, we know from studying modern tiger sharks that they will bite things to assess their palatability. Is this something I want to eat? Well, this shark bit it. Obviously, it did not ingest it because those tooth impressions would not have survived the passage of uh, the fresh feces through uh, the digestive system of, uh, of the tiger shark. We know that modern tiger sharks will ingest all kinds of things, uh, things that they should eat and things that they should not. I've even heard of like license plates being preserved in modern tiger sharks. Uh, but we don't think that tiger sharks uh, really engage in coprophagy. That's a term used to describe an animal that actually eats feces. This is not uncommon, uh, both amongst living organisms and in the fossil record. So uh, there are several ways to account for how those bite marks may have come to be preserved in the feces, right? They were defecated into the water, and they were settling to the bottom, and the movement of that uh, uh, fecal material attracted the attention of a tiger shark. It bit it, and when it did, it decided, you know, I'm just not that hungry, and, and let it go. And the feces sank to the bottom, were entombed and preserved. And 15 million years later, Dougie Douglas found it, brought it to my office, and I, I, got to tell, I got to tell the story. Or it may have already been on the bottom of the ocean, and the shark may have just been engaged in exploratory behavior and marked it that way. However, when you flip the copper light over, you can see that there are some very faint bite marks. And if I think the feces had been either on the bottom already or floating through the water and the shark bit it, that the teeth in both the upper and lower dental arcades would have evenly penetrated the feces. Now I can't prove this, but I think there's a possibility that the, the feces were actually still within the abdominal cavity of the marine crocodile. And when the shark plowed into it with such force, its teeth penetrated the wall, marking the feces the way that it did. And then the shark, and then the, rather, the croc was disemboweled. The feces were then shed, sank to the bottom, and became fossilized. As you can see, uh, <laughs> I could go on and on because there are so many other amazing uh, uh, fossils that have been preserved both locally and elsewhere uh, that I have been able to study. And uh, there's a whole grist, as you can see, of people here who I've collaborated with in institutions uh, that have uh, allowed me to, to extract and learn and be able to tell these stories. So I'm very grateful uh, to these people and institutions. And also, I'm grateful to the citizens of Calvert County. So the Calvert Marine Museum here in Solomons is a county facility. And 60% uh, of our budget comes from uh, the citizens of Calvert County. And I'm grateful to the County Board of uh, County Commissioners for sponsoring uh, and uh, supporting the museum. 
And I'm also exceedingly fortunate because I have an endowment which allows me to do many more things uh, than I could do if I uh, didn't have access to this endowment. So thank you very much for your attention and uh, I uh, will look forward to trying to answer some of your questions. Oh, thank you so much. I do want to remind everyone watching that you can ask us questions or make comments in the chat. We do have one comment, which I agree with, <laughs> that is thinking about whales mangled by Megs being around our ancient seas. Like just that statement alone, like it's so mind blowing to think of all those cool things that you can piece together. From um, and you shared a lot of those fossils with us, but if you could pick really one of those to be your favorite one, what do you think that would be? I mean, I think the most unusual fossil, the rarest in the fossil record would be the shark bitten coprolite. I mean, when you think about just the probability of something like that happening, uh, when, that, when Dougie brought it into my office, it was the first that had ever been found in the fossil record. It was completely unique. Nowhere else in the world had uh, a coprolite been found that was even bitten by a vertebrate. Uh, let alone a shark. And lo and behold, he brought to me a second specimen, which isn't as compelling, but I think it shows that it was also bitten. Another co uh, crocodile coprolite was also bitten uh, by a shark. Now there are a few more that we know of in the fossil record. And so this is the way that it happens, right? You publish something and so you put the information out there and there's a, a, a huge pool of amateur and avocational uh, paleontological, you know, paleontologists who are passionate about, about the science. And uh, if they uh, learn of a publication like this, they will then contact uh, the person who has published the paper and let them know that they have a specimen like this in their collection. So I'm aware of others that exist in, uh, in private collections. Uh, unfortunately, I can't publish on those, but uh, maybe someday they will donate them and I would love to be able to tell those stories. So it would have to be that shark bitten coprolite. Oh, that's so awesome. Um, it's so hard to think like so back, so far back in time, like of these giant, you know, 60 foot sharks swimming around um, and things that they're eating as well, which is going to come to a question I'm going to ask you a little bit later that I've been asked a whole bunch of times, but I'll save that. Um, so up next, we're going to go ahead and bring in Sean. He has a question for you. So I'm going to let Sean mostly introduce himself. Yeah. Hi. <laughs> Dr. Godfrey. Uh, so I work out at Whitney Marine Lab, and obviously as a wetland ecologist, I get to spend a lot of my time in the field watching, whereas you with your with paleontology, you don't get to spend time obviously observing as much as I do. So my, my kind of question for you, I, I guess, is, is a slight two-part piece. Um, just curious if you get to spend any time out in the field at all. Um, you know, to observe and, and things, or do you rely on some of us making our publications and things? Um, and and then I guess uh, part two to that would be how much has modern tech um, evolved your work? Uh, I guess I think of some of the things I'm doing now with LIDAR and other pieces and drone and imagery and, and being able to look at, you know, firsthand without having to always just be in the field where mm -hmm. it, it has really evolved how quickly we can uh, you know, populate data sets. Right. Uh, to your first question, uh, I don't have the luxury that you have okay. of being able to spend a lot of time in the field looking at to the behaviors of modern sharks and their mm -hmm. predatory activities. So yes, for sure, I'm relying heavily upon uh, publications. In fact, just today, I was looking up publications on predation by great whites of seals because I have this amazing seal foot bone, it's the calcaneum, okay. in which is embedded uh, a fossil shark tooth. It's the first example in the oh. fossil record of a fossil shark tooth embedded in a fossil seal bone. So we have in the fossil record examples <laughs> of seal bones that have been bitten by sharks, but never before has anyone published on uh, a shark tooth embedded in a seal bone. So that's gonna make a nifty little paper. So I was looking up because I'm not quite sure yet, it sort of looks like it could be uh, a partial tooth from a great white. Uh, and so I was looking up publications and of course, the, <laughs> that's gonna be my basis for any okay. uh, uh, comparisons or possible 
predatory activities. You know, and, and I, we we know that uh, you know sharks are preying heavily on on seals. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, I'm envious. I would love to be able to spend more time in the field to watch. Uh, oh, we, might, we, we can set that up. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, uh, your second question relating to technology. So every generation of paleontologists gets to come back and restudy the fossils that have been studied previously and in the light of new discoveries that have been made you know, it, it, during the course of that generation, their generation of, of paleontologists. And in my generation, uh, the tool that I rely most on would be x-rays and uh, CT scanning and micro CT scanning. Okay. Because my advisor, Bob Carroll, when okay. he was a graduate student at Harvard, he had a, a tiny, relatively small fossilized um, amphibian skull. And he actually had to physically grind it and take photographs of it and grind it and take photographs of it so he could see like the morphology through the specimen. Well, at the end of that, you have no more fossil, right? It's a destructive analysis. And now all I have to do is take the fossil to the hospital or up to Johns Hopkins or some other place where they have a micro CT scan facility and, and we can see what's happening inside. Because the wonderful thing about fossilized bone is, in its vast, vast majority, the original bone minerals and all the internal structure of that bone is preserved intact. And so you can clearly see what is going on inside that bone, or in the case of, of sharks, the cartilaginous skeleton. And that gives you a wealth of information uh, that uh, in the past you would have had to have destroyed, essentially, in order to get it. The specimen would be gone. And so we have these uh, techniques of non-destructive um, non-invasive analysis of fossils. Not to mention that the field of uh, um, <laughs> uh, trace biological molecules that are preserved in fossils is just like mushrooming. There's such an amazing coming of age uh, in the analysis of biomolecules, right? These are not what you would typically uh, associate with uh, the process of fossilization. You would think that these remnants of soft tissue would be completely uh, destroyed. But in fact, a lot of them are still there. And we're now beginning to tease those out. And so as technology improves, right, it becomes more sensitive, uh, we are going to be able to look at the fossils that I've told you about in the next generation in the light of uh, new discoveries and reinterpret those and pull even more information out to tell a more complete story. And I find that very exciting that uh, the science of paleontology will never end and there's always room for the next generation. So you shouldn't think if you're, if you're young and watching this that everything that is going to be done in paleontology or could have been done has, has been done. There's lots more to study. In fact, the field just keeps growing as, as other scientific disciplines come in and provide their understanding of the natural world to give us a, a greater picture like what you do in, in studying modern ecosystems, we can now apply that to the fossil a fossil record. Yeah, thank you. I yeah, I once had those dreams and aspirations to to do paleontology. So as a you know, this is for, a big treat for me to. So thank you. I just love that you just tied everybody in together too there at the end. Like that was just awesome because yeah, it just who knows what we're gonna find, right? And like the kids watching right now. That could be that kid, you know, so it's just yes. awesome to, to see right. all those fields kind of coming together. So I just want to remind you that if you want to be featured in our presentation or ask Dr. Godfrey a question, just go ahead and put it in the chat. Don't be shy. Um, and next, we're going to go ahead and introduce Kenzie Horton. So Kenzie, if you could just briefly introduce yourself and then you can go ahead and ask your questions. Hey, Kenzie. Hi, Dr. Godfrey. Um, I'm Kenzie. I'm a graduate student at Jacksonville University. Um, I'm working on my master's where I'm studying the movement and fine scale movements and diving behavior of white sharks along the Atlantic in the Southeast United States. Wow, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a really interesting study and I'm learning a lot about this population, but also comparing it to other populations, um, you know, around the world in Australia and Afri uh, South Africa um, and looking at kind of their movements and behaviors mm -hmm. and diving um, and like hunting tactics and behaviors. Um, do we see any, um, records, especially in the fossil records of megalodons and other regions that um, use that same um, disabling tactic that was seen in the, um, the dolphin caudal bones? 
So remarkably, you would think uh, that because Megalodon was the top predator for about 20 million years, that we would have many more fossils, like the ones that I've described to you, that I credit to active predation or scavenging or uh, failed predation. Um, but remarkably, there aren't that many uh, that have been described, specifically crediting those encounters with Megalodon. The other thing is that What's remarkable about some of the fossils I showed you, they, I, I think on one of the slides, it said like trophic behaviors. So we don't think of, I mean, behaviors are ephemeral, right? What I'm doing right now is not gonna be preserved in the fossil record. And yet these fossils that I described, in a way preserve behaviors or preserve evidence of certain kinds of behaviors. I'm hoping that with uh, the publication of these papers relatively recently, uh, certainly from the ones that I've showed you this evening, like the, the, the caudal, the pedunculate vertebrae in that dolphin that had marks on both sides, that one was published in 2018. So that's not that long ago. And so as uh, these papers are put out there, I hope that it will uh, elicit other paleontologists or other um, avocational paleontologists to bring their fossils to light and to publish on what they have. Again, for your benefit, to give us a more complete picture as to the diversity of prey that Megalodon was preying upon. And perhaps we will be able to develop or uh, gain a better understanding of some of their preferred hunting tactics or techniques. Now, I mean, I think Megalodon was just big enough that it, you know, it like took down whatever it wanted, wherever in the body. Modern great whites, uh, generally, I think are, and, and you can correct me on this, can be, can tend to be uh, relatively specific. For example, if they're hunting odontocetes, like toothed whales that can echolocate, they don't typically attack from the front because the dolphin can like see them with sound. They will typically attack from below or from behind where that echolocating, that biosonar would not give them away. Now, Megalodon might have engaged in a similar kind of behavior when attacking Adonisites, and that's why maybe we see these, these bitten tail vertebrae that they were uh, doing the same, sort of, uh, same sorts of things that modern great whites are doing. But again, we don't have enough examples, enough published papers to be able to say, here is a trend, here uh, are the, the, the preferred techniques uh, for hunting that we see in the fossil record uh, attributed to Megalodon. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah, it's really interesting. Like, I've been so fortunate being able to work on, you know, a modern species being able to use telemetry and all kinds of different um, tactics to kind of figure out what they're mm -hmm. doing. So I can't imagine what it's like trying to figure out movements and behaviors and hunting tactics from, you know, an extinct species. But right. Thank you. That was the only question I had. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so I do have one question from a group of students who couldn't be here today, but their teacher sent me a question. So they are from the Mayport Middle School, which their mascot's the shark. Um, so they're in Jacksonville, Florida. So they wanted to know a couple of things, but besides teeth, is there anything else you find from megalodons? Yes, we find their vertebrae from time to time. Now, here along Calvert Cliffs, remarkably, in 200 years of collecting, we have found many teeth, uh, but we have maybe one vertebra uh, <laughs> that's on display uh, of a relatively large-ish sort of sized uh, megalodon. I mean, the vertebra is about, you know, like, like six inches in diameter. I'm not even convinced that it is absolutely from megalodon. Very recently, we found uh, five associated vertebrae, which we think there's a possibility that they came from the very end of the tail of Megalodon. So other than that, uh, vertebrae and teeth, uh, I can't, I mean, maybe there are other examples of ossified, I'm not sorry, of a fossilized cartilage. So as you know, the skeletons of sharks are made of cartilage. Mm -hmm. Now, some of that cartilage is mineralized cartilage, and so it has uh, ba basically like rock-forming minerals sort of in it, and it, so it has a better chance of becoming fossilized. But a lot of the skeleton is made up of a prismatic cartilage, 
which uh, there are two layers that uh, bracket sort of a flexible cartilage on the inside. And the, the prismatic cartilage is made up of thousands, hundreds of thousands of little tiny tesserae, little tiny, almost like crystals, mineralized crystals. And my understanding is that they are held together with organic fibers. And after the shark dies, those organic fibers disintegrate, decay. And so then those little prismatic pieces of um, mineralized cartilage uh, basically just uh, disintegrate. And so the skeleton then does not survive. Uh, examples of fossilized skeletons of sharks in the fossil record, they're exceedingly rare. And so you have to have the, um, you have to have ideal conditions uh, for, for parts of the skeleton of a shark to become fossilized. Whereas teeth are fairly heavily mineralized. The outer layer, right, the cutting surface is made of, an, uh, of a material that's very similar to the enamel, the tooth enamel that we have in our mouths. And so it's referred to as an enameloid. And because it's so durable, that's why we find so many uh, shark teeth in the fossil record. Yeah, and I think it's important for kids to know too, like modern day shark sharks are cartilaginous as well like not a whole lot has changed since then just the size kind of got a little bit you know maybe about a third of the size has uh, shrunken down but yeah so no thank you for that that's one of the i get asked that question a lot in the classroom um when we talk about sharks is why are why we only find teeth so thank you for answering that um so up next we do have Lizzie, and she has a personal interest in the area that you're located in. So I'm going to go ahead and let her introduce herself and ask her question. Great. Hi. Thank you, Dr. Godfrey. My name is Lizzie Hennessy, and I am actually a public health professional out in California. Hmm. But I grew up on the eastern shore of Maryland, and uh, my background's in environmental science. Okay. So I'm curious, what is being done to prevent erosion with Calvert Cliffs? Well, <laughs> so as a paleontologist, and uh, <laughs> I mean, I uh, so this is kind of like a, a relatively big issue. Uh, so these cliffs have been eroding for thousands of years, and they are eroding because of the waves that pound against the base of the cliff and uh, the cliff is undercut. Because the sediments are not indurated, and they're not naturally cemented together, as I mentioned uh, earlier in the talk, uh, the cliffs can fail catastrophically. And so they can erode from inches to feet per year, depending where you are along Calvert Cliffs. And so there's increasing pressure, right, from property owners who have houses. And as the price of real estate goes up, uh, they, of course, are interested in preserving those those sediments so that they don't erode right back to the base of their house, at which point it would become condemned. And so uh, larger uh, sections of Calvert Cliffs are being riprap. There's revetment, large boulders that are be pl being placed at the foot, at the toe, the base of the cliff to prevent uh, the waves from undercutting the base of the cliff. And so then the vertical cliff over time will, because the, the toe has been, um, uh, armored, the, the top of the cliff will erode back to an angle of repose of about uh, 30 degrees. And then it will become covered with vegetation and there would be no more erosion. For me, it's uh, really unfortunate in a way that we can't turn the clock back and buy all the property, you know, for a good distance uh, behind the cliff face and turn it into a World Heritage Site because this is a truly remarkable Miocene um, biota. There are over 650 different kinds of organisms that have been found as fossils along Cowart Cliffs and uh, the other cliffs along the tributaries that also flow into the Chesapeake Bay. So it gives us uh, the best portal into this Miocene world uh, anywhere along the uh, Atlantic uh, coastal plain. Now, the cliffs have not been completely uh, uh, rip-wrapped uh, because there is an endangered tiger beetle which needs to have freshly eroding sediments in which to tunnel and for the female to oviposit, to lay its eggs into this little tube that it creates. 
And then the, the larvae live in there and they're ambush predators. So they will feed on anything that you know crawls up the cliff face and then they go through their life cycle. If those fresh eroding cliffs are not there, then that um, endangered tiger beetle would uh, lose this natural habitat. And so in a way, I'm grateful for the, the tiger beetle because not all of the cliffs have been riprapped. Certain sections have, have been bought by both Calvert County and the state of Maryland. And fortunately, the, the part that has been purchased by the state of Maryland is the best uh, place for us to, to look for fossils. It has the highest concentration of fossil shark teeth in the cliffs and also dolphin skulls. Great, thank you. Awesome question, Lizzie. That was like so cool to hear his answers with the talking about it went from the fossils to the erosion to these new beetles. Like it's crazy how it all just kind of works together because you're trying to conserve the past, but also the future, you know, so awesome question. All right. So we do have one more um, panelist to bring in and we will allow for a couple minutes at the end if anybody has last minute questions. So I'm very excited to bring in Sarah. Um, she is a science supervisor here in Florida where I live um, in Sarasota where they also have a ton of Megalodon stuff pretty close to her. So Sarah, welcome and go yeah. ahead and a little more introduce yourself. I didn't call you Dr. Sarah, but <laughs> so if you want to introduce yourself and go ahead and ask your question. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Yeah, I never know what to put when it says like enter your name. So I just went with it. But my name is Sarah Burkett. I'm the science specialist uh, for curriculum with Sarasota County Schools. And I'm excited to be here. And among many other things that I oversee and do besides supporting teachers and curriculum development, um, I also help oversee the science fair and write grants, but um, our SRC for the science fair is Dr. Carl Luer, who specializes in shark research as well. Um, so I've uh, had the privilege of learning quite a bit from him over the, the last few years of being in this role. But um, I guess my one question uh, is, you know, what's one thing you wish you would have known or understood or were aware of um, earlier in your career? and um, maybe one piece of advice that you have for aspiring scientists. So for me, uh, throughout my undergraduate degree and my graduate degree, and even as a postdoc, and early in my career when I actually lived in, in Alberta, Canada, in Drumheller, which is the dinosaur capital of Canada, it was never, I was never taught or really informed that uh, avocational paleontologists. So these are people who just, just do paleontology because they're passionate about it. They love paleontology. How much they can contribute to the science, to advancing our understanding of uh, the diversity of life through time. Most of my publications have come about as a result of fossils that have been found by that community and donated to the museum. And so I get to collaborate with them. Some of them have become co-authors on these publications. And it's a wonderful symbiotic relationship because they're really interested in finding new and cool stuff. And of course, that's what I'm, I'm interested in as well. But they greatly extend our reach, right? I, I'm not able to be out in the field like constantly prospecting and collecting because I have you know administrative duties and I want to sort of write the papers and, and get them published. We also have a fossil club and so I have responsibilities there. We do a newsletter. So they, you know, like I said, extend our reach. They allow us to do so much more beyond what just myself and our collections manager would be able to do uh, here in this relatively, well, this small department of paleontology at this relatively small museum here in, uh, in Calvert County. So yeah, I'm very grateful and happy that, you know, and I didn't learn it as soon as I started here 25 years ago. It kind of came to me as I, as uh, I, you know, worked with volunteers that work for our department, contribute so much in terms of helping us in the field and also preparing the fossils that we find. And also um, just getting to know this large community that was here before I, before I arrived, right? They were, they were collecting Calvert Cliffs long before I was here. So that would be the one thing that I have learned that has proved to be very important and significant. And uh, I'm very grateful that I kind of 
clued into that and worked with them. So they, they have taught me um, probably more than I've taught them. So <laughs> yes, thank you. Yeah, I feel like sometimes, you know, our practices are very isolated, but when we're open to what everyone else has to offer, we can do so much more. So thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. I have one more question and it's the big elephant in the room that every single student of mine asks me when I taught marine science. And also my friend Molly asked me, is there a chance Megalodon still exists? So I would love for Megalodon to still be alive. And I would, I would love to be the guy who discovers the living Megalodon. I mean, that would be like so unbelievably cool. But just because I want for that to be that way, uh, I can't make it happen. If Megalodon was still alive, it would not be the Megalodon that we know from the fossil record, right? The Megalodon we know from the fossil record is a very large macro predatory shark that is specialized, that was specialized at feeding on animals that are living in the photic zone in the upper layers mm -hmm. of, uh, of the oceans. So they're feeding on marine mammals, right? So their prey during the uh, Oligocene, Miocene, and Pliocene, right, were, were not deep diving, deep dwelling, abyssal kinds of creatures. So if for some strange reason, Megalodon abandoned, right, the photic zone and, and became an abyssal shark, natural selection would have molded its body into a completely different kind of shark. So yes, the Megalodon that we know from the fossil record is extinct. I think it was the end of the lineage uh, and it became extinct now that there was an earlier paper that was published that uh, that proposed that they became extinct about two and a half million years ago. The most recent one is about three and a half million years ago. Remarkably, though, <laughs> I don't know that I should say this, but in that in that more recent paper, there were fossils uh, fossil uh, teeth of megalodon that were found in younger deposits, which were worn and were. Um, discredited ha as having come from more recent younger sediments, even like up into the ice age. The evidence would certainly suggest that Megalodon became extinct at about three and a half million years ago. But mm -hmm. I think there's the possibility that they, they lived longer than that, closer to, to the present day. Uh, but we really have to, so an extraordinary claim like that would, de would demand extraordinary evidence. Yeah. So I once heard, uh, you know, someone say that if Megalodon was still alive, fishermen wouldn't be wondering if they saw a Megalodon. They would know without a doubt that they had seen a Megalodon. And so that's typically my, my reaction, my response. Yeah, it's not, it's, not, it's not a mega mouth or a Greenland shark or, a, you, know, or right. you would know that yeah. it's a Megalodon. Yeah. It'd be a bus coming at you. Yeah, yeah. yeah no, I, I got asked that. I can't tell you how many times as a marine science educator. So marine science teachers, there you go. There's your little clip to show the kids. It's very um, hard. It's very hard to hide an animal that's 60 feet long yep. that's feeding on whales and dolphins. And larger whales and dolphins too. Like right, we just right. simply don't have the food source. And I also read a paper that just the ocean, like the ocean just isn't the right, you know, climate or you know ecosystem for them anymore either um so there's a, there's a whole lot to it um we all want megalodon to be real but we can have them real you know in our hearts and in fossils and um through the work of people like dr stephen godfrey so thank you so much for taking the time to meet with us this was awesome um as a you know shark lover i just always love hearing you speak um so if you guys Want to join along with us for any more talks like this? Please follow along with us on our uh, website. So you can go to www.headwaterscienceinstitute.org. If you have any specific questions that you want to ask more about this topic or any other kinds of presentations that we do, please email me at jen at headwaterscienceinstitute.org. And make sure you follow along with us on all of our social media channels, as well as our YouTube channels to get more content like this. So thank you so much for joining us and have a great night.
Thank you.